Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to the screening of Mr. Soul. To those of you are, who are just joining us, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Waka Anwusa. I am the Chief Curator and Vice President of Curatorial Affairs here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. So before we get started with tonight's dynamic panel, um, just a few things. You can check out more of these amazing programs. We are celebrating the sounds of Black history this month and all year long here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But to check out more of the events that we have coming up in February, you can go to rockhall.com slash events to check out more, check out the schedule there, RSVP for the programs there and just learn about what else we have for this month and beyond. There's a lot going on. So really excited about that. But two programs that I do want to mention before we get started tonight. Actually, we have a program on Monday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern with uh, the authors Daphne Brooks and Maureen Mahone talking about Black women in rock and roll, a discussion. So excited for that. So make sure you check out rockhall.com events for that program. And then on Friday, February 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern, we have none other than Robert Randolph with the family band doing a, who did a live performance here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and discussion. So you can check out more again at rockhall.com. If you are in the Cleveland area, you can check us out live. We're open seven days a week um, and you can check out the times more on our website. So without any further ado, I wanna stop talking and get into this amazing and dynamic conversation that we have tonight. So without any further ado, please help me in welcoming our first panelists for tonight the one and only Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, bassist extraordinaire. Please let's welcome Mr. Verdeen White to the stage. Hey, hey, hey Walker, how are you? It's so good. It's so well, good to have you, you here. Thank yes. you. Yes, honored to have you here. Next, I'd like to bring to the table, to the conversation, Singer, songwriter, performer, actress, entrepreneur, none other than Ms. Patty LaBelle. Hi. Ms. Patty LaBelle. Hi, welcome. How oh, are yes. you? I wish I could be there in person. <laughs> I, I know. Right. Wish we all could be here in person. I know. Thank you. We're doing the best we can. Thank you. We are. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. Our next panel for this evening is the filmmaker and the visionary behind this amazing documentary, Mr. Soul. Please help me welcome Melissa Hazlip. Hi, hey, Melissa. Now. Oh, it's so good to see you. So glad to be here. Oh, wonderful. And last but not least, our moderator for this evening, Trailblazer and Shiro. Please help me to welcome Miss Stephanie Rance, the found the co-founder of <laughs> let me get this right, Run and Shoot Filmworks. Get it right. All right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Stephanie, welcome. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you. This is this is gonna be a great evening. You know, every time I see uh, Melissa's film, it just blows me away. And I'm just so disheartened that I didn't see this when I was a child growing up in New York City, although I was a baby. I can't believe I didn't know about this amazing show, but I'm so glad we're going to unpack it and talk about it with Miss Patty and Mr. Verdeen. I'm super excited about that. But before we get to the three of you, Waka, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Tell us about your role at Rock Hall and your plans for more, rep for more representation for a from a multicultural standpoint. Absolutely. Well, again, um, you know, being in this role as the chief curator and uh, vice president of curatorial affairs, we are, you know, a, a, a staff and team of storytellers. You know, we're here to shape the narrative, to redirect it for, uh, you know, to reflect the future, to reflect the times that we're living in. Um, and that's really what my goal is. You know, I, I'm honored to be a curator in this role at this particular time that we're living in right now. Um, you know, we all have our levels of activism. We have all of our levels of how we encourage, inspire, and influence. And this is my stewardship. I'm honored to be in this role. So not, you know, it's not that we don't tell these stories um, 
of black musicians or, or BIPOC, you know, musicians of color. But my goal and my mission um, and, and my tenure here is to just amplify those stories, amplify these narratives. And that's what we're doing here tonight. Well, said. and just to give a little backstory, you know, the way that we hooked up was just so it was like it was meant to be. When you and I started talking, shout out to Ron G for making that happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just, you know, I would tell him, I was like, Waka is just so delightful. I really like her. And, you know, I came to you with this amazing film, Mr. Soul. I thought it was going to be a great fit. And I was so excited that you and the rest of the team at Rock Hall was like, yes, we have to do this. We have to yeah. tell the story. We have to salute Melissa Hazlip. We have yeah. to salute her Dean and Earth, Wind and Fire, Patty LaBelle and everyone else who was uh, who was on this amazing show. So I want to I just want to say thank you for doing this. I definitely appreciate that. So Ms. Yeah. Melissa Hazlip, my sister, I've known you for a long time. You had your film at our film festival on Martha's Vineyard and just a um, like a, a, a rough cut of the film, not even the finished product, and blown away when we first saw it. And I'm so proud and happy. I know this has been like over 10 years in the making, putting this film together. Tell us, how did Mr. Soul come to be? Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Shout out to Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival and <laughs> whoop, whoop, so much love for us filmmakers of color and thank you for supporting us creatives and thank you to the Rock Hall for hosting this incredibly epic and historic evening. Uh, this film came to be as a way to pay homage to an era, to a show, to a man, but also as a love letter to our blackness. Yes. And to really live in the blackness and see the beauty and to restore this wonderful sense of pride. We wanted to look back at this moment at this beautiful sort of cultural gem and let it inspire us for today. And it was all about the music, right? Because music is universal. And we wanted to tell the story of black music and combine it with the story of soul and this idea of diversity and inclusion and representation on television for the first mm -hmm. time. And it was just such an amazing story, an American story. You know, black history is American history. Mm -hmm. And we just thought this is a perfect vehicle because it's the greatest show you've never heard of. <laughs> you've never seen it. Many people hadn't. You know, so we wanted to explore something that was like old and new at the same time, but also really to just remind our folks, remind black folks of our greatness in this difficult time we're in and to be inspired and maybe learn a little something, something. And, and you did that. Thank you so much. It's a, an amazing documentary and I salute you and uh, you deserve all the accolades that you're getting. So Miss Miss Patty, we're so happy that you're here. I know you're having issues uh, with connectivity with this blizzard you guys are having in Philadelphia and in New York. It's insane. I'm in Denver and it was like negative 10 last week. So it's I don't know what's happening with the universe right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm here and I'm happy to be here. And we're so glad that you could do this. So you perform with the Bluebells, Sarah Dash and Nona Hendricks. You were the first musical guest on the premiere episode of Soul, September 12th, 1968, singing one of my favorite songs, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. What, a, what an amazing piece. We're going to show it to the audience right now, and then we're going to talk about it. I said, yeah, if you put an exclamation All right, thank you. After. I never forget when the show started and you strike up the band is this wow, you know, live and in color, the soul show. Live and in color from New York City, so welcome. And now the very first musical performance of our show, Sarah Dash, mm -hmm. Nona Hendrix, Patricia Holt, <laughs> also known as Patty LaBelle and the mm -hmm. Blue Bands. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> we look at the first show. Essentially we got star. Oh my gosh. How does it feel to see yourself back then, Patty? How does it feel seeing that? Yes. It's it's so raw and so real and so honest. And that was uh, our first, we were the first on that show, which was amazing. And after that, 
I was really careful about. Uh, and he would have us on the show so many times. You would call it the LaBelle show. They used to call it the LaBelle soul show, soul show because he had us on so many times as Patty LaBelle and the Bluebells, uh, Patty LaBelle, LaBelle, the baby LaBelle before we started wearing the outrageous uh, clothing and all of that drag. Uh, so, and then after we did that performance, we never came back with the full LaBelle outfits. You know, but but we did a lot of us uh, soul, and we were appreciative of of Alice for always calling on us. Did you realize that you were making history at that time? Did you did you even think that what Ellis was doing was going to be so groundbreaking? He he was such a visionary. Mm. Well, we were hoping, but I never thought that it would be that big. You know. And when you do something like that, being the first act on a show like that, you pray that it'll go on and on and on because he was the reason that black folks were able to show their talents because he showed everybody black. He, he had us, you know, really happy for his platform because we, we got away with uh, people seeing us who never saw us before, you know, and, and like I said, it was a black show, but there were some white folks watching, you know, all kinds of folks were watching the show. Yes. So how did he find you all? Like how did how did that happen? How, and and you said you all said yes. Tell me how this how that process was. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> now he found us. Now the one that you could ask that question would be Sarah Dash. She uh, remembers everything, everything about everybody and the time it happened, what day, what year. Uh, so I would have to ask Sarah that. Okay. So I have no clue. I was just happy he found us. Well, it was an amazing performance. So it definitely, we, you know, we could tell that the, you guys were stars in the making. So salute to you Thank as well. You. So Mr. Verdine, Thank you and yes. yes. Earth, Wind and Fire, January yes. 10th, 1973. Epic yes. performance. I want to show it before we talk about it because you are doing your thing. So let's okay. show that. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. <laughs> Oh, you were doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> How did that feel seeing that, Verdine? I love that. I, I'm look. I'm looking at that. You know, uh, first thing I see, Kenny, Jesus, and uh, uh, and uh, we were grooving. That was our actually our first time coming to New York. Oh wow! You know? And uh, we had just signed with Columbia Records. We had just put out the Last Days and Times uh, record. You know, the album. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and in that particular uh, performance, we had Jessica Cleves, a uh, female who was with us, who was with the Friends of Distinction, then she joined us. So that was the first time we really put our foot into New York City. And and uh, as Patty had mentioned, uh, when they did it, that was before, uh, uh, you know, the big costumes. And obviously for us, the same thing as, you know, because I didn't have a shirt on, so obviously I couldn't afford it. <laughs> so, so that was before the that was before the big uh, 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 costumes and all the things that happened for us later, and it was an exciting thing for us because as a band we had never really been to New York, mm. and uh, uh, and that was our first time really being in New York City, you know, uh, uh, with the excitement, and of course the show was not only entertainment but it was very cultural, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was about it was politics involved, it was culture, so we were very proud to be on the show and excited. You know, because don't forget now, you had people like Asher and Simpson, Nick and right. Val, you had Jesse Jackson mm -hmm. giving poems, Harry mm -hmm. Belafonte. So we knew about the show before we went on. And, you know, this is good for the younger generation to see uh, what the foundation of what they're leaning on was happening back then. You know, a lot of the issues that we're talking about, you know, in our communities, this is not new. We've been, we've been working on this for a while. And, you know, we've had a lot of unsung heroes, you know, 
Uh, Patty knows. I mean, she's out there. She was there then, there now. Yeah. Uh, this was the. It was the foundation of hip hop. You know, all the records that they used, right? That, that were made by us previously. So it was a. It was this. It was a cultural movement as well. You know. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So what was so what was your impression of Ellis when you met him? Did oh, you see that he was a, go ahead. Mm-hmm. He was very cool. We were intimidated because we had saw him on television before. <laughs> and uh uh and we were young, so we were very in awe and and uh, we knew it was an important show for us because I was it was before we had horns. We didn't have horns then either. Uh, uh, before we had two sets, before we had shirts. Um, um, I think you didn't want to wear a shirt. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the, it was the beginning of being part of of not only music but culture. It was before Soul Train, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And don't forget, I was a, it was diverse uh, uh, talents, you know, uh, of that show. So we loved the show, and we were very honored to be on it. Excellent, Patty. One more question for you before I go to Melissa. Tell me your impression of Ellis when you met him. What what did you think? My gosh, dressed his face off. I mean, he he had style like 20 men and just so quiet and elegant. And sometimes I didn't know what to say to him because he's so laid back and quiet. You know, his answers were very slow and drawn out and perfect. <laughs> so it was just amazing being around him with all of that talent, but very soft-spoken and mm. just an elegant man, just an elegant man. How wonderful. I wish I, I could have met him. Melissa, tell us about the process from thought to conception and making Mr. Soul. And what made you want to do this? Well, I really wanted to do it because I realized that nobody had really explored this era, right. this sort of the black arts movement. And so many of our African-American icons of the 20th century come from there. And it was really important to give them their flowers while they're here and to really celebrate black love, black strength, black sister and brotherhood, black politics, black agreement, black descent, and and put it in a form that was entertaining, historical, but really just like I said, like a love letter. And we wanted to do all of that and to make a documentary so that we could you know, document this important time, but also just to like vibe on the music and really appreciate all of these artists doing their thing. So we approached it with like three different stories to tell the story of soul, the story of Ellis Hayslip, and then the story of the nation, what was happening in television and what did soul interrupt and change everything, you know? So it was kind of a hybrid documentary and pulling all these stories together and really treating music as a character because it's really the soundtrack of our lives but it's it's about our pain and our struggles our successes our loves and and it's all in the music it's all in the soul you know I love that. Thank you. What a beautiful answer. You know, we were doing a tele- uh, radio interview at the crack of dawn this morning. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you shared a really interesting story that I'd love for you to share with our panelists and the audience about um um I'm drawing a blank now. Um, the two songwriters. I can't believe I'm drawing a Ashford blank. Ashford and Simpson. Ashford and Simpson. I'm having yes. a brain. Apologies. No, it's okay. It was early. It was like 6.30 this really morning. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to WBAI, though. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, Nueva York. So we got to give a shout out to our dear friends over there. Um, So I told the story of Ashford and Simpson as an example of how Ellis always saw the future. He's kind of like an an Afrofuturist, you know? He saw what was ahead of you, even if artists couldn't see it themselves, he could see what was their better story coming up and always wanted the best for them. And so at the time, Ashford and Simpson, they were just singer songwriters, but they were really writing for other people. You know, they were actually on salary at Motown, writing Mm. for Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell and the Supremes. Mm. But Ellis said, no, you gotta do your own music for you. And they said, well, we don't know how to do that. We don't even perform. And Ellis said, you can do it because this is your moment. We want you to step into your greatness, which is something that he was always doing. Mm. And so he encouraged them gave them a whole show. They Mm. hadn't even married yet. They hadn't dropped an album yet. Wow. They didn't even have a, like a, a personality for their group, but Ellis saw their future and said, you are gonna be stars, but you have to do it for yourself. Right. You have to do your own thing for you. 
and, and watch it grow. And that's exactly what happened. And that was his contribution constantly, like pushing the culture forward and seeing something that you couldn't even see in yourself. Nice, that is so beautiful. Yeah, when you shared that story this morning, I was like, oh, wow, that's a great piece of history that no one knows about and I wanted to talk about that. So thank you for sharing that. So Waka, what does it mean to have screened this movie for, with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? And what does it mean to you to have these living legends here with us, Miss Patti LaBelle and Mr. Verdeen White? Gosh, you know, um, this is truly a house. The Rock Hall house is where we just celebrate just legends, icons. And, you know, to have um, Verdeen White and Miss Patti LaBelle here with us tonight, I mean, it's tremendous. This is, again, um, Melissa, as you've been saying it, just celebrating our legacy, our impact, um, not just for today, but for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so happy that even, you know, this is a virtual event that this piece of history, even what's happening right now, you know, this conversation to have Verdine and Patty on speaking um, mm -hmm. is it's so huge. I mean, I don't think this is a conversation that exists out in the virtual world. I don't know, I haven't seen it. Um, right. But, you know, so to have this, this is monumental. And this is, again, yes. the waves that Ellis Hazlip is, has, is still making. Um, you know, so it's, it's truly an honor. I mean, to, again, have this narrative, again, a story that, you know, I wasn't born when the show was out. Um, but to have this be a part of my history, um, mm -hmm. it's, all, it's a piece of all of us. And I mm -hmm. love that music and arts and culture really connects us in this way and that we right. can still learn about this now <laughs> and no better place than to learn about it than at a museum. Um, and so to have it here at the Rock Hall, is just a perfect fit. So I'm, I'm beyond, this is like a curator's dream. I'm <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I love about it, what mm -hmm. Melissa had mentioned, uh, talked about black culture, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the aspect, you know what I mean? Whereas, you know, we've had aspects where we've talked about black exploitation, which was not mm -hmm. the, uh, the name that, that we created, those names were given to us, black exploitation, mm -hmm. but black arts, you know what I mean? And and now, you know, we have the, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, but there was a foundation of shows like this, that this generation can kind of go back and see that we've always been committed, you know? Yes. We've always worked at this. We've always tried to come up to the different level of culture and bring the best culture, you know, the highest level of what we have to offer as a people and, and artists. And shows like these are really great. And I'm just glad that while I was, we were back way back then and we're still here now. And uh, uh, who knew what was going to happen for us? Had no idea the things that happened for us uh, started back then, you know. So right. it was a, we were in the right place, right time, and the right show. You know, and Verdine, in keeping with that vein, what do you remember most about performing on Soul? The audience, because don't forget now, New York is cool. They're, you know, they're hip, you know. and uh, and that was like before disco. So everybody was like hip, you know what right. I mean? It was a cool thing. If you got on that show, you were like really cool. You were like really hip. You were, you were, you were taken seriously. That's what I'm trying to find the right words. You were taken seriously. And of course, you know, we were after that. Of course, in the beginning of Maurice played the Kumbo, which had never been uh, played on national television. And I think our, that show was ran, I think about eight or nine, 10 times in New York City. Wow. Yeah. Wow. With WNET, I think, right? WNET. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Miss Patty, so, and I know we've been talking about this, but I'd love to hear it from your voice as well. What made Soul such a revolutionary platform for Black artists? Oh, wow. Well, it was, I'm sorry, with finish, honey. I said, what made Soul such a revolutionary platform for a Black artist, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, as I, as I said, we performed on that show so many times and Ellis always wanted us to go forward and grow, you know, as he did uh, Nick and Val. Um, and so we had a chance to do his show. and We did Nina Simone's Four Women and he lost his mind. And so did we in the audience. I mean, it was so, it was like groundbreaking for, uh, for us to do that song. And also the revolution will not be televised by Gil Scott Harum. We, we did a lot of that growing on his show. And the audience is very, said they were very laid back and they're right in your face. Like you, you could sit on the audience lap. They were right there. Right. That right. always made you feel some type of way like they're gonna see my stock and tear or whatever. Oh, it was just so close and personal, up close and personal and so raw. 
so raw. Yeah, we, we learned a lot on that channel. I don't think there's anything like that ever since Soul. Do you guys agree no. with that? Do you think there's any other show that really I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Interesting. Wow. Mm. Mm. So Melissa, let's talk about your relationship with, with, with Ellis. How did that impact your choices in making the film? Well, I had grown up with Ellis since I was a little girl. He was my very first babysitter. Oh, wow. So that was convenient because I fell in love with him very quickly. <laughs> but he also brought people to the house uh, as a convenient way because I was a kid and he could bring other kids. So he would bring people like Betty Shabazz, you know, after mm -hmm. we lost uh, Malcolm. He brought Betty and took care of Betty and brought the kids. And so I was running around under the table with Malcolm X's children. We're still friends to this day. It was a very, very special time. And getting to meet artists like Nikki Giovanni and performers mm -hmm. like Melba Moore and Clifton Davis. These were all people that were at my apartment, you know, when I was really little and it impacted me. I saw the magic in the arts. I saw these people that seemed to just vibrate, you know, this whole thing about vibrations on another level. And it inspired me and encouraged me to become an artist. And he said to me, you know, you're the one, you're definitely going to be an artist hmm. from a family of educators. And so I, I felt like he was pushing me forward. And that really encouraged me. I, he took me to Broadway shows and to see dance. And he said, this is our culture. This is ours. And we need to take care of it. There was always this this feeling of love and protection for him. It wasn't about clout chasing, you know, he wasn't trying to be buddied up with celebrities. He really, really loved his friends and his people and his artists that he pushed forward. And so that gave me a real great respect for the art and the work and, and invariably becoming a producer myself and wanting to continue that and push that legacy forward. And there's, I, I wanted to say to Miss Lavelle, something that you did really impacted all of us. And that is for the last show in 1973, I don't know if you remember this, but you sent a telegram to Ellis Hazlip as your friend and you encouraged him because he was sad that the show was ending and he reads it on the air. Oh. It's actually in the oh. film. And he, what you wrote was, although it's over, it's not the end. Black seeds keep on growing. And wow. even though those yeah. were the lyrics, of course, from you know the main ingredient song, Black Seeds Keep On Growing, it was so profound. And wow, thank you for telling me that. The whole film is built around <laughs> this idea that we are the black seeds and we have, we have to keep putting out our seeds and we have to keep growing and, and curating this garden and pushing forward the legacy generation after generation. That's for sure. Thank you for reminding me. I did do that. I remember that now. Wow. Oh. <laughs> oh. You know, it's, uh, these platforms, uh, it gives an opportunity for the the uh, the current generation and the future generation to take a look at so shows like so. You know, these mm -hmm. platforms are very valuable because without these platforms, they would never know. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of things can get lost in history and a lot of the new generation might not be educated as to all the work that was done before they got there. Sometimes they think that they might be the first one, you know, that, you know, that marched, might be the first one that, you know, that were committed, that dealt with all the different issues in our society from, you know, the arts and jobs and women and, and kids. And it, this was here before, you know, this was here before, you know, and this is great that it's going to be here. Uh, they can go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and they can pull up on these platforms to see what was here before them and be, in, and be inspired too. And right. Be inspired. Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, since we're sharing stories, I, I, I want you, uh, Waka, to share one of your favorite Verdine stories. And I'm going to share a Patty story that she didn't oh even know that I knew. But go ahead. <laughs> what I do, Waka? Um, what I do? You know stuff. what? <laughs> Melissa, you said something so profound in starting this conversation that soul this is a love letter to the music and there is a friend a mutual friend that verdine and i have mr bruce Tallman. and oh, yeah, Brucey. yeah and i i mean so his book soul funk and r b i mean mm -hmm. some of these moments which are captured and, and when we're talking about the celebration of of black art and culture mm -hmm. um bruce was able to capture those right. moments 
through his photography. Mm -hmm. And for Dean and I, I had a chance to literally for real be not a fly. Well, I was a fly on the wall here, but, but I, I curated the show. That's but right. To see, but to see Verdine and Bruce have this beautiful conversation, I mean, that was such an honor just to even be in the room. I've, mm -hmm. you know, had these beautiful moments of obviously seeing Earth, Wind, and Fire perform and um, and these great moments. But to have that conversation and Verdine see, seeing you reflect on these moments and the impact and to really understand how you've made such an impression on our culture, on this globe, yes. I forever mm -hmm. am just grateful for having that experience. And just, to, hey, I was in the back. I was holding your bag. I was holding your bag. I was holding your bag. It was a proud bag. I was like, you know what? <laughs> Let me. I was, it was a proud moment. And But just to truly have that story, that's forever with me. And so you are truly a love letter to the music as well. well thank, oh. that, thank you. Uh, uh, Bruce and I very yeah. well. This pandemic is over. We have a plan on touring this around the whole country. Oh, um, yes. You know, and letting people see this book. Uh, I yes. give this book out as gifts to people. Yes. And uh, uh, the book actually started, you know, as Bruce said, you know, with Maurice, myself, in my living room, because Maurice thought that it should be documented, you know, of, of, of artists, you know. And, uh, uh, and you had Rick James doing stadiums, things that people don't know. We might think that Beyonce and them are the only ones, but this was going on before. No, no disrespect, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this book right. is, sort of shows everything about touring, and and Patty's mm -hmm. in there. They're all, we're yes. all in the book, and 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 Bruce, because of that, uh, is only the second uh, African American in the National Portrait Gallery as a oh, photographer. Oh, yes. You know, and he was inducted in when we were in last year, the National Portrait Gallery, and then a week later we got the Kennedy Center honors, and a lot of yeah. had a lot to do with Bruce, and and I was able to thank Bruce you know, in front of the audience and things like that. And the other photographers that were there were taking his picture, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and so it was, it was so, but it started with Walker at the, uh, uh, at the, the Grammy Museum and it was, and it was, wasn't long enough, you know, never mm -hmm. long enough, but it was a great mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that, Waka and thank you for Dean. So, Miss Patty, you're not going to know this story, but I started my career as an assistant at, uh, EM, SBK EMI Records, and I worked for Don Rubin and Charles Koppelman. And Don Rubin had the idea to do duets with Frank Sinatra. And you, <laughs> <laughs> and you oh, did yeah. Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. Do you remember this? Oh, yes. <laughs> when I, don't know, I remember we were in New York at the, I think it was the Hit Factory, and you were there, and you did it, and you had, of course, all this food, and I, the first time, I, the biggest shrimp cocktails I've ever seen in my life, and you <laughs> were just so um, gracious yeah. and lovely, and what you don't know is that once you recorded that, Don and Charles would play that song every day in the office so loud that, because we were on the 42nd floor, we were all the way up top, all 96th Avenue, and the people on 41 and 40 would come up and complain because Don would play it so loud. You did your thing on that song. Thank you. I appreciate that. I love singing that duet with Frank. Um, not together we were. I was in that room. You know, with that, he was on the screen and whatever, but you know, back in the day. And just hearing after he heard it, he said he brought all of his friends to his house and said, you That's have right. to hear this. Movie. And I was so impressed by hearing that story. It was wonderful. One yeah. of those moments, honey, yeah. Well, thank you for, for being there. <laughs> I was just a little distant then, but I was just so happy that I was in the room. And, you know, your track was one of my favorites. I mean, you really just belted out that song. And I'm telling you, they played it every single day in the office. And it was just such a great experience. Nice clear. Well, thank you <laughs> so much. <laughs> All right, so we have some questions in the chat. I've got to put my readers on because I'm a lady of a certain age now. So, <laughs> Melissa, for you, I love the score of the film. Can you tell us who composed that? Yes, the score is extraordinary. The score is everything. It's by the most incredible composer, Robert Glasper. Yeah, Glasper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Glasper is just the yeah. bomb. Yeah. And he, you know, shout out to Robert Glasper and and bringing in, especially we wanted to have, you know, we started the film, the first song you hear after the Al Green intro is Donny Hathaway. Mm -hmm. And yes. we wanted to start the story with Donny Hathaway, 
And after we tell the journey of soul, the journey of soul music, we've got to end it with his daughter, Layla Hathaway. So Robert Glassman wrote this beautiful song called Show Me Your Soul together with Muhammad Ayers and Layla Hathaway and she's singing it. And we just love Robert because he was able to bring in all these elements because you know he comes from gospel, he comes from soul, he comes from mm -hmm. art, he comes from jazz. everything, jazz, hip hop, everything, fusion. Mm -hmm. So we needed somebody who could understand that and take us all the way from the beginning, all the way up to you know, the present day and with that kind of versatility. And we also knew we'd have a lot of music from the show. So we, we needed a score in terms of music that would be a real workhorse and could weave us in and out of all of the archive and the new stuff because that, so that it wouldn't be jarring to jump from, you know, archival music to contemporary music. And he just, he just nailed it. We had some wonderful musicians and I can't wait to share the soundtrack. It's coming out soon. All right, thank you. Okay, this is for Verdine and Patty. Um, and you guys can decide who goes first. This Patty goes first. Patty, Patty goes, goes first. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you, this Verdine. <laughs> this year celebrates 50 years since Earth, Wind & Fire's debut album and 50 years since the formation of LaBelle. What's the secret to your impressive longevity, Miss LaBelle? I I believe in not going to Hollywood, not getting a big hit, not getting grand, not being untouchable, not being unreachable. Uh, always grounded um, with people, the uh, the mailman, the people at the grocery store. I'm just a basic, cool lady. I'm I, I have to brag on myself. I'm very laid back, very shy, but very honest. And I say a lot of things that get me in trouble, but that's me. <laughs> You know, I, after I say it, I said, well, I, I wouldn't have said it any different way because I believe in being yourself totally. And with uh, LaBelle, I mean, Sarah, we, we spoke about an hour or two ago and Nona. And so we still have the plans of bringing it back together. Oh, we wow. never said it, wow. never. And most people think that it's over wow. for LaBelle. Honey, we got it going on. And we know. plan to do something again. You know, you can't let that love die. That's you know? wonderful. You heard it here first. Oh. Right? We're going to bring it back. We will. I love that. Yes, yes. Can you answer your question? Say that again? Did I answer your question? Of course you did. Absolutely. And Great. The yeah. same question for you. <laughs> 50 years. That's salute, man. That's I'm so happy, first of all, to give both of you your flowers. Because I believe in giving people their flowers while they're here. And I just... We're just so honored to give you both your flowers. So, Verdeen, 50 years, Earth, Wind & Fire, how, what, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you don't know you're going to get 50 years. You know, oh, when, yeah. when we were playing mm -hmm. that night on so we had no idea what was in store for us. We were just happy to be doing it. But I have to say, first of all, you know, we had a great leader in my brother, Maurice. She mm -hmm. was an incredible leader. Don't forget, we were, we were kids. He was an adult. So yeah. he really led us really well, and and Philip and Ralph and myself we're still very close. The band is great. We got five generations, and we just kept you know keeping our head down, and doing the work. You know what I mean? And and the message is still the same. It's about love. It is about love, both of you. Your message is definitely uh, about love. For Melissa and Waka, any chance of a soul? Ah, oh, here we go. We are gonna do this. Uh oh, chance of a soul pivot one day at Rock at Rock Hall. I'm gonna say that is a huge possibility. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay? Let's go. I'm like, what? <laughs> Let's definitely do that. That's yeah. amazing. I love that question. That Melissa, good. let's talk offline. We'll we'll get that okay, together. Okay. okay. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> bet, 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 bet. Yes, yes. <laughs> and this is for both of you, Patty and um and Verdine. What advice do you have for artists coming up today? R and B artists that are established, uh, you know, that want to have 50 years longevity and artists that are just starting out. What is your best piece of advice to everyone who's listening now? Patty's first. And it's like over 500. Okay. It's like, I would say to anyone who's trying to do whatever they think they're good at, you know, and a lot of people tell them that they're not good at it. But if you really believe in your heart that you are, you just keep persevering and do it honest from the heart. And, but, you know, there are some things that you might not should do. Uh, certain times a lady thinks as though she might have to do extra, like with her dress. And um, 
sometimes with the words, um, and you don't have to. I mean, I would just say stay true to yourself, but don't do something that you might feel bad about later, you know, and uh, go out there and get them, get the world, because the world is open for new artists and new sounds and new everything, but be a little, well, just be yourself. I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but <laughs> talking about, but I can't say it, but you know what I mean, but be good and be good and be good at it and honest. And honest. So that's great advice. Yes. Verdine? Well, you know, Patty said what I was going to say, be yourself, be honest, and you have to make it your life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, as you saw, that what we you saw was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's a long time to survive on your originality. And uh, so you have to make it your life. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, because by making it your life, you're able to grow with it. You're able to develop with it. Uh, you're able to just get better and leave a contribution. So you have to, I think you have to make it your life. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. Um, I have just two more questions. One for you, one for you, Waka. Melissa, The Last Poets on Soul, that was revolutionary and groundbreaking. You know, that was very, um, for that time, even for this time, I don't even know if that would even happen. But for Ellis to, to have that amazing group on that show was was definitely mm -hmm. something that um, spoke to me and I, I, you know, was, was just amazing. What, what were your thoughts when you saw that? And I'm I, so glad it's in the film. I was so excited and so surprised. And so like, what? Like this is happening, <laughs> first of all. It was October 24th, 1968. It was the fifth episode. Was he trying to get fired? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this idea oh. that you bring them out and be so unapologetically black mm. and so of the streets and like with the now and what's happening, what's what's going down, like for real, mm. that was mm. unbelievable. It was bold, it was unapologetic, and it was groundbreaking, and it was art. And yeah. so, you know, when I first saw it, I'm thinking, am I going to have to censor that? Mm. And thinking, no, why would I censor something that wasn't censored even 50 years ago? That's not my job because it really is art. And it's and they are the forefathers, you know, the godfathers of hip hop. Amen. So we need to see that. Mm. We need to understand. We need to honor the source. You know, that's something that means a lot to me. Honor the source. Honor the source. The source of everything. The source of hip hop and life and truth and and all the poets that came from that, Nikki Giovanni, yeah. Sonia Sanchez, you know, mm -hmm. this is our, this is who we are. These are our griots. Yes. And these, these are our storytellers. And now we can say, you know, black lives matter and black stories matter. Tell black yeah. stories was, I remember your yeah. hashtag, tell black stories and let us be the ones who tell it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's all about authorship as well. It's Absolutely. all about representation as well. Absolutely. And, and, and it all starts there with that truth, that golden piece of truth. And I love that clip because everyone's looking a little uncomfortable, like, Ooh, okay, <laughs> okay, we're doing this, okay? But that, even that, like someone told me, you should cut that and just get right to it. I'm like, no, you need to see the oh, discomfort. Yeah. You need to see the, what they're like uncomfortable sharing the truth, but they know they got to do it. Right. And I don't know that we would ever see that now because there's, mm. you know, uh, investors and there's commercials and there's mm. other things that would guide what you can and can't say. But I think it's really beautiful. I think it's emblematic. And I'm so proud to have the last poets in the film. They are real strong supporters of the film and they were grateful because it was their first time on television too. And can you imagine yeah. a poet? Mm. And getting to be on television like that, you know, all is thought as high art. Yeah. You know, with that, and I agree with you 100%. It's funny, Bruno Mars did a post. I don't know if it was recent, but it was posted today. And he said, you know, when you think of rock and roll music, mm -hmm. you have to understand that every all music comes from the motherland, it comes from Africa, mm -hmm. whether it's pop, soul, hip hop, jazz, R&B, it all started with, with that African beat. And do you all agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, well, well, as you saw in our segment, you had the kalimba. That's right. Mm -hmm. you know, and they mm -hmm. call it the African thumb piano, you know? And Maurice was the first one to introduce the kalimba to popular commercial music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure was. Wow. Absolutely. So oh, we've got another question in here. What can fans do to support the film? It was simply incredible, tears in my eyes watching it. Oh. Well, what fans do, go ahead, Patty. 
<laughs> right. I, I, watch it. I mean, it, it's an excellent uh, film, uh, beautiful. And like I said, Ellis gave life to those who were afraid to show their life. Right. Uh, like the poets, you know, and when I saw that part, I said, oh, go. And they said what they had to say. So he gave people uh, reasons to believe in themselves, you know, and don't be afraid. Don't shy back from something that you think might be gross. Just give it out. You know, and that's what this film is wonderful. People have to see the film. Absolutely. Absolutely. And last question for you, Ms. Waka. So what's next for Rock Hall? And thank you again for having us all and for and for giving us this platform. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, this was truly an honor. And this is what we're here to do. This is what institutions are supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, sharing these untold stories, highlighting yes. and amplifying the the unsung heroes, Ellis Hazlip, I mean, is definitely one of those pillars that we need to be amplifying. Um, I will have to say, you know, this perfectly aligned with the, um, an exhibit that we have on display now. It's been said all along. And to Verdine's point, to Miss Patty's point, this, this work has been happening. You know, this is not, yeah. 2020 was not the start of it. You know, the murders and the and the rioting and, yes. or in the protests that we saw just of last year, that was not the first time. That's right. Sadly. I mean, this has been going on and we are standing on some heavy shoulders. So right now we have an amazing exhibit on display and on um, online virtually where you can just learn more. And these stories of Ellis Hazlip and of, of Earth, Wind and Fire's impact, of Patti LaBelle's impact will be added to um, this exhibit. So that's one of the things that we have coming up. And you can just always go on rockhall.com to check out what we have um, for events, exhibits, and all of that great stuff. So thank you wonderful. for that. Yes. And, and for the both of you, what's coming once we can, you know, meet again safely. First of all, dinner's at Patty's house when we can all meet. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Absolutely. That's for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Right. <laughs> and we're going to Patty's house for dinner. That's number one. Absolutely. Right. So what's sure. what's next for open and fire, uh, Verdine? What what do you guys have on the plate after COVID? <laughs> You know, we're all dealing with this pandemic, of course, all the artists, you know, speakers, you know, from every walk of life. So when when those doors open, we will knock them down and you will see us. Fantastic. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. All right. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Ditto. Wow. I want to thank Ditto. everyone for joining us this evening. Verdine White from Earth, Wind & Fire. Waka Anwusa from Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, director extraordinaire, Melissa Hazlup, and the one that I call my sister. Yes. We thank Miss Patty LaBelle for giving us her time this evening and sharing her wonderful stories of Mr. Ellis Hazlip. You. you guys support this film. It's an amazing film. I'm Stephanie Tavares Rance, and I wish you all a good night. Peace, love, thank and you. Oh. Right. Oh. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>